Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back again to the uh, Pineland Speaker Series. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have with us a few members of the New Jersey Fire Service. We have uh, Bill Sibsky, Bernie Isaacson, and uh, Courtney um, Covetry. Cov Cov I think I might have got that wrong. And uh, today they're going to really focus on uh, Choose Your Own Adventure. They're going to talk about uh, the ecological forestry, the Pinelands, and um, some of the things that they're working on to manage Pinelands, and you're going to have an opportunity to participate. So you're going to be able to um, make some decisions. They're going to have some information for you to follow along and participate in some surveys just to give them some input, and uh, your decisions are going to help uh, you know, them show some of the different management options for the Pinelands. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn the program over uh, to the foresters, and uh, we're going to go on a Pinelands adventure uh, in the forest. Hi, okay, everyone. you guys are good to go. Uh, thanks, Joel. Thanks for the intro. Um, maybe we'll just do brief intros. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Bill Zipsy. I work with New Jersey Forest Service as a supervising forest uh, forester, uh, doing a number of uh, things at the New Jersey Forest Service uh, with a specialty sort of uh, these days geared to geared towards uh, biometrics, the measurement of living things. But we're going to talk to you today. We have a choose your own adventure, a little bit different format um, and maybe a little bit odd for being on YouTube. But the idea is we're setting this up that you can kind of choose uh, your, your fate uh, throughout this presentation, at least in the first recording. So understand that right now, as this is live, uh, the you'll be able to text in your responses and then we'll be able to choose your own adventure that way. If you're watching this after it's been recorded, obviously those choices, you won't be able to make those choices live. But the folks watching this live, thank you for participating today and we hope you have fun. So I'll, uh, I'll introduce uh, Bernie Isaacson next and, uh, here at the New Jersey Forest Service. Go ahead, Bernie. Hi, I'm Bernie Isaacson, um, I work at New Jersey Forest Service, and I do uh, uh, research and decision support for, for the Forest Service. I work with uh, Courtney and Bill uh, pretty frequently, and uh, really hoping you enjoy today's interactive uh, uh, webinar. Courtney? So hi, everybody. I'm Courtney Compton. Um, I'm an assistant regional forester, again, with the Forest Service. I work primarily for the State Lands Management Program, so doing a lot of the management activities and planning for all of state lands across the state. Um, so I'm gonna be helping guide you through our uh, presentation today and help you with some of our uh, polling activities uh, that you're gonna be interacting with. So we're gonna move on to the next slide here. So I'll just give you a, a quick run through and as I'm talking about this, you guys can try it out at home. So there's gonna be a couple of different ways that you can uh, log in to participate, it's pretty easy. So the first one, you can use uh, the web address that's on the slide right here. So that pollev.com slash Courtney, C-O-M-P 370. You can also uh, use your mobile phone and text to the number 37607. Uh, so your message will say Courtney, C-O-M-P, 370. And then as uh, Joel described a little bit in the description uh, on the YouTube site, you'll see that um, the website information and also the texting information is in there as well. So you can also copy and paste into a, a separate tab or um, into your browser as well. So we're gonna give you guys all a minute just to kind of digest some of that, test it out. So the first screen, when it comes up, you'll see it'll ask you to maybe put in your name, something like that. It doesn't store any information. Um, it's just gonna tell you that you've uh, logged into the session and you're able to participate once it's active. And the mobile phone, it'll give you something similar. It'll say, okay, you've logged into this session. Um, you know, and you can start right in that message uh, as we activate the first question and go along from there as each question comes up. I believe also from the mobile phone, it sends you a link. So if you get that link and it opens in the phone's browser um, and it asks you whose poll you want to participate in, you'd put in that Courtney Comp uh, 370. Or th yeah. All right. So with that, we're gonna all try it out together. So once you log in, I'm gonna pull up my screen here.
and it should be active now. So you'll see the letters. We have A, B, C, and D. So we have the age old question here for our test question. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? So it looks like we have some answers coming in already. That's good. We'll give people a few more minutes to try it out. We should also say a cord is a unit of volume uh, to measure uh, a wood. So it's four by four by eight feet. Um, seeing a lot, a lot of, a lot of good responses here. And it's good to see that it works. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for, for participating. So this is great. You guys will have a lot of fun as we go through our, our choices and our Pinelands adventure path moving forward. All right, so it looks like we're working pretty good here. With that, Bill, do you want to reveal our answer? All right, we'll reveal the answer to the age old question since, uh, you know, in inquiring minds want to know. Um, so there is a logic behind this, but we're having a little bit of fun, of course, with um, how some of these things are calculated. So our, our, uh, our calculated answer for what it's worth, uh, we, we were doing some research and found the average woodchuck can chuck about 700 pounds of earth per day. Uh, and that the average um, weight of a green uh, red oak species cord of firewood is approximately 5,000 pounds. So that's 0.14. Uh, pound, 0.14 cords per day. And over the course of a year, that would be approximately 51 cords. So, so very good guess, everyone. Um, yeah, just having a little bit of fun with some of the calculations and, and you'll see, uh, you know, so thank you. It's, it's good to see the polling is working too. So uh, glad to have everybody on board with us today. All right. Thanks everybody. So then we'll pop back into our presentation here and we'll go from there. So uh, we wanted to open up by talking a little bit about the Pinelands landscape and uh, had picked this picture uh, from Christopher Smith um, uh, to kind of make a point, right? So when you think about the Pinelands landscape, I know a lot of folks maybe first encountered it, maybe first encountered it either canoeing or driving through it on the way to the shore, right? And it looks kind of uniform when you're on the ground, you see all these smaller pine trees, you know, or, or these pine trees, and it looks very, very uniform. But the reality is it's, it's actually very diverse, right? Like there's, there's a lot going on inside the Pinelands. And I know many of you uh, being here for a Pineland short course probably already recognize that, but, um, but the idea is that it's diverse, right? There's, there's lots of, there's lots of variance on the landscape and little changes uh, can mean a lot, right? So you can be the few feet of elevation difference can mean the difference between being inside a primordial feeling cedar swamp and being in a very open or scrubby uh, pitch pine upland that's burned many, many times. Uh, but also there's this human component, like we're interacting with this and it's been interacted with through history. We're going to talk a little bit about that and have some choices to, to go through that. So there's been a lot of interaction. So this photo is particularly interesting because you see like this very blue water in the front. I'm sure many of you know what that's usually associated with, right? Sand mining. Uh, and then you see agriculture in the background, uh, probably cranberry bogs are very flat. There seem to be perimeters, right? So then anybody who's driven down 563, routes 563 in the autumn, right? You've seen them flooding the cranberry bog. So we know that this land is very diverse and people have been interacting with it in a variety of ways. So they interact with the land and the land gets altered and the, and the way that land, uh, what, what that land produces and how people interact with it. Think about um, recently, right? The Garden State Parkway had been shut down for a wildfire, right? So that changes, the land also changes how we interact with it. So I uh, wanted to point that out as we go through this sort of uh, adventure together and, and talk about what's going on in this, that uh, think about these interactions. And there's going to be a lot of discussion uh, through the ages, how, how, how that shaped this land and where that leaves us with different choices. Next. So one of the tools we're going to use to help guide you through it, and some of you who have tuned into or, or seen presentations that we've done from the Forest Service in the past are probably familiar with, we use a, uh, a collection of models called the Forest Vegetation Simulator. Uh, we've been using this collection of models that's packaged up. This is freely available software from the USDA Forest Service. Um, and basically you can calibrate this software to 
uh, project. In fact, those of you who have seen presentations from us uh, on other topics, right? We use this quite frequently when doing planning where we'll take data uh, about the forest as it stands now, and then we'll take that and project it into the future. And we can look at various metrics and, and forecast what we think the forest will look like given different conditions. And also you can reconstruct different types of management choices or, or, um, or disturbances that have happened in the forest, right? And we can recreate them. Uh, the other cool thing about this is, yes, you can use it looking forward and we do use that when we're planning, but you can also use it to reconstruct conditions in the past. So we've had a little fun with that in this, uh, to be able to tell a story through history uh, and, and recreate the outcomes of some of the choices you'll be making today. Uh, Courtney graciously ran this in FVS using real data from the Pinelands today. Uh, although these are not tied to specific places, um, you know, it, it, they're, they're designed to, but the, the data does come from the actual Pinelands. And then uh, to reconstruct conditions as it probably would have like, looked like through different scenarios that we're looking at on the landscape. So we're using that model today. And as you can see, it makes these beautifully rendered graphical trees. Uh, I know I'm joking because with you know, today's modern graphics, obviously, but it does create this visual, which is kind of interesting because they are backed by numbers and actual measurements taken on the ground. And that, that, that piece of this model is called the stand visualization system uh, so that we can give you visuals of what might have happened when you make these choices uh, as we confront these different choices uh, at different historical points. Uh, through the Pinelands history. Um, so yeah, here, here's the tool and sort of how it works, uh, uh, so, sort of uh, what will be going on behind the scenes here. Next. So the format that, we're, that we chose for today, because we wanted to do something that's interactive, right? We really like bringing the, the audience uh, in and having participation and questions, but it's kind of hard to do that um, online. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a Pinelands forest that, you, that you're involved with. And to start the history of that forest and what that forest looks like today, what it looked like when your, your family might have um, arrived, we're going to start with the people who were here for a long time before the current society, the, the current culture that's here. So um, there were people here. There were people on this landscape. Um, the image on the right is um, an image from the Delaware tribe. So the, the people who, um, uh, whose ancestors were the most recent indigenous peoples of, of New Jersey. Um, and there's some interesting things to take note of in, in what their, that drawing of their home life uh, looks like. So that this, this uh, painting comes from the tribe, from the Delaware tribe. Um, and you can see they have a lot of the same things that that we have. They're interested in having shelter. They're interested in having clothing, um, a place to cook food, um, having food, um, water. They're interested in family. Um, the resources that they need, uh, they have a lot of the same needs that we have today. Um, they're people just like us and they were here and they were here for thousands of years. Um, next. So um, just to make that clear, because sometimes I think people uh, tend to think of there being a hard break when, uh, when the landscape was dominated by uh, European practices um, and, and Native American practices. And there are, and there are, you know, important differences. But um, so these are quotes from, um, from a book that was put together uh, at the dawn of the Pinelands Commission, um, the Natural and Cultural Resources of the Pine Barrens. And yeah, the area was uh, thoroughly exploited and inhabited by vast areas had never been observed. The absence of, of, you know, a vast network of sites has less to do with these areas, you know, the Pinelands not being used, they were used, uh, and has more to do with the fact that there hasn't been as much development. So there haven't been as many as, as many archeological surveys as there were in other parts of the state. Um, there were, uh, the uh, Lenape were using this landscape um, didn't make a distinction between one geographic boundary that we have today and, uh, and you know, another, they just used it. It was just the land. So there's ample evidence and long history of people being here. So how did those people, how did they use it? What did it look like? Next. So uh, David Peter DeVries um, makes some notes about this uh, offshore about this sweet perfume, the smell, right? Of the, the, uh, the native setting fire, um, right? And they're uh, burning thickets in order to hunt. He talks about smelling the land before it was seen. So when they're out at sea, 
Uh, so I don't know how many of you are around uh, the Pinelands uh, the last couple of weekends, but right, what's going on in the Pinelands right now? A lot of prescribed burning, and there was a wildfire last week, right? And here's from the sandpaper, right? Per control burning starts uh, in New Jersey, right? Usually around this time of year in the winter, right? And, or up until uh, mid-March. And think about what pine burning smells like, right? Very, very good description from DeVry, right? It, does, it doesn't smell like something in your chimney. It smells much sweeter when those pine needles and the pine is, is burning. So DeVry points this out that, yeah, they're burning. Uh, and they're burning, um, you know, the, the, uh, the seasonality of that. Well, we'll talk a little bit about that more from some, uh, some other observations. But right, there, there's some sort of... Uh, there's something going on on a fairly large scale, and it's and he describes the 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 Indian setting fire or the native setting fire at this time. So right there's there's some sort of decision being made here, and 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 they're making a decision, interacting with that land, in a conscientious way. Um, so just wanted to point that out. This is uh, Devry in the 1600s. So this is this is you know well before the American Revolution. Next. So <clears throat> I don't know if folks are familiar with the cultural area concept. So this is the idea that um, if a culture occupies an area and you have record of that culture practicing a certain behavior or using a certain technology in part of that area, then it's likely that they're probably using that, that, that uh, technology or practice uh, through the rest of the area. So this is also from the 1600s from um, the early colonial history of New Jersey. Adrian Vanderdonk uh, in New Netherlands, this is more North Jersey, um, but describing that the Indians have a yearly custom, right? Burning the woods, plains, and meadows in the fall. So again, dormant season burning. And what's really fun about um, Vanderdonk's account is that he also mentions that the bark scorched three or four feet high, so you get a sense of flame lengths and what this fire would have looked like. And he talks about, for the most part, that you know the trees aren't injured. He mentions, yeah, sometimes the fire gets into a thick area of pines, but the burning down of entire woods never happens. He says the trees all survive. And so he's describing a very, very different fire regime where uh, we've got uh, the same one as DeVries, but different from maybe what we think of the Pinelands being today, right? We've got low and low flames, uh, surface fire, and very, not very much mortality from fire, uh, tree mortality from fire. Next. And likewise, uh, Peter Lindstrom in the uh, mid 1600s observes, right? Uh, now as the winter bids good night, right? That the natives are setting fire to the grass in a, in a circumference so that the fire won't be able to run back, right? So th they're conscientious of wind direction. And uh, what they use that fire for, uh, they're setting grass on fire, which is interesting, but they use it to drive game. They're using it for hunting. Uh, and this is, this is very, this is, these are, you know, this is a pretty sophisticated use of fire. They're actually using it to drive game and using it for hunting. So this is not some random setting of fire. There's, there's a, a thought process behind this and there's a choice in terms of uh, the seasonality of that. And right, this isn't uh, that hard to depict today, right? Like, in fact, we know, in fact, the picture on this slide is uh, Aboriginal Australians um, use, doing a very similar practice and using fire for hunting. So other cultures have used uh, fire this way so we can observe some of this going on today. And we know that, yeah, there are these sophisticated choices being made and that the understory of these forests looks quite a bit different than what we're thinking of, right? That there's some indication here that they're utilizing that. So their, their choices about this land shaped it in, in ways that are, uh, are different, but there's some commonalities too, right? Like they need to eat, right? And Bernie had shown you they had shelter, they needed, had a need for shelter. So some of the needs are not really that different from, our, they're not different from our needs today. It's just how they use that land and interacted with it. There, was, there were sophisticated choices being made. And, and we can see evidence of that and liken it to cultures uh, today. Next. So these images here are just uh, a representation of, we think, uh, what these open woodlands, grassy areas might have looked like. So again, like Bill mentioned earlier, these are um, what we call SVS images from that software. So we had an idea about the spacing between trees then uh, that the natives did, uh, usually annual burning and that kind of thing. So these are just uh, visuals to help you kind of imagine what that might have looked like then. 
So we have a couple of accounts from the 1600s where they get as specific as describing things like the plant community um, and number of trees per acre. So number of trees per acre, uh, getting into the biometrics that, that Bill mentioned before and the inputs that we need for the software that, that Courtney was just talking about. Um, right, so the trees grow generally not thick, but 25 or 30 upon an acre. And there's accounts all throughout of the sort of the occupancy of the woodlands, how many trees there were and how big they were but also the plant community, that there's grass. So that there's grass in the understory tells us a couple of things. One, grass tells us that there's enough sunlight at the forest floor to grow grass, which is, um, you, you know, very specific conditions. But two, it also tells us that the, you know, annual burning, well, grass grows back every year and it's the sort of thing that you can uh, reburn frequently. Um, so there's enough fuel to carry a surface fire every year if you have, or free, very frequently, I should say, um, if you have grass. So that's a very, very different forest in a lot of parts of the state than maybe what we see today. Yeah, actually kind of interesting comparison is professional foresters uh, looking at that, uh, the Lowry, the G Gawain Lowry um, quote, right? When they say, you know, there's 20 to 30 uh, trees upon an acre and you know, on the high end, 100 trees per acre, just thinking of uh, some of the counts in the Pinelands, it's not uncommon to see over 300 trees per acre in the Pinelands today. A little bit less than that in New Jersey, but uh, uh, in northern New Jersey, but often double, at least double 100 trees per acre. So that's kind of interesting for context. Next. So what might that have looked like? Uh, this is a sort of a representation from elsewhere on the southeastern coastal plain. I believe this is longleaf pine. Um, but describing how Lindstrom describes the forest, how other authors describe it, right? The forest does not grow so thick, but the trees are standing far apart from one another. So here's, a, here's an example of a pine, a southern coastal plain pine forest with grass in the understory and the trees big and planted far apart with grass about as high as the other authors have, have mentioned. This sort of seems like a good, uh, maybe an analog of what, what might have been here. Next. And so we talked about uh, what the people's needs were. Well, they certainly needed to eat. Um, and the, the animals that they were eating uh, is interesting. When you look at these different, the, the different authors, they don't just mention deer. Now we're used to white-tailed deer now today in New Jersey. We think about white-tailed deer as being the, the even-toed ungulates that we'd expect to see on the landscape. Um, but a number of authors from the 1600s mention deer and elk, or they'll say deer and red deer. And Europeans, a European red deer is very similar to, to an elk, they in appearance. Um, so they're referencing the grass as high as a man's middle and they're, they're mentioning that specifically for elks and deer. So that sort of, um, sort of hints at the intention of maybe why some of this land was burned the way it was or the, the, the feedback and the, the, the relationship, the symbiotic relationship between burning and to produce this habitat or burning for hunting that would then produce this habitat. Also, even into the 1700s, there's examples of uh, the forest being open. Uh, Peter Kalm, who was a Swedish uh, professor of, of botany from Sweden, um, mentions that uh, lupine is abundant in the woods which is uh, really very, very different from what we think of today. I'm pretty sure it's um, much, much rarer today than, than being common in the woods. Also, it's interesting because uh, lupins are associated with fixing nitrogen, so often relatively um, disturbed or open sites. And um, elk, think about those of you who have been out west or seen the elk population over in Pennsylvania that's been sort of re restored there. Uh, think of where they occur and, and what they graze on. And yeah, they, they tend to graze, right, elk? elk do eat a fair amount of grass. So that's kind of interesting to see that they pointed that out and that the, there was this habitat there. And, and thinking of what those places look like either in Pennsylvania or out west where elk roam, there's often grass uh, growing among interspersed trees. Next. And uh, another example of, of uh, animals that might be taken for food and that would do well in this kind of habitat, uh, we've got heath hen and quail. So um, uh, in his book about the heath hen in 1928, uh, Gross talked about heath hen being the first birds to be mentioned um, by the colonists. Um, he was talking about New England, but talks about their range being well throughout New Jersey and maybe down into the Carolinas. And heath hen are like, um, like a prairie chicken. 
there's really interesting anecdotes from those uh, from early colonists in contracts in Massachusetts saying that specifying that uh, uh, servants are not to be fed uh, heath hen more than three times a week. This is table fare. It's common. It's abundant. Um, and they were the kind of birds that would have done very well in uh, a very open woodland conditions. Um, Keith Hen are now extinct. Uh, they, the last one died out on, in, I want to say 1930 or 31 in Martha's Vineyard. Um, another example of uh, this, the open woodland birds um, is uh, Bob White Quail. So Calm in the 1740s describes describes Bob White Quail as being, you know, abundant everywhere. It's hard to walk, you know, you only have to walk a short distance in the woods before you find a great coveys of them. Um, quail are uh, very much uh, rarer today. And they're only, uh, I want to say there's a very small population that that uh, is reproducing naturally. But for the most part, you know, the habitat isn't as suitable for them today as it might have been then, um, just based off of, you know, these descriptions. Next. So um, what we're trying to convey here, and yes, we are setting the stage. There will there will be more polls. Don't worry, they're coming. Uh, but we're setting the stage because we want, wanted to understand that, you know, pre-settlement, people often think pre-settlement, uh, you know, what did it look like? Were people really interacting with the land uh, in a meaningful way? So I wanted to point out uh, there's this image from the DelawareTribe.org, and there's a number of historic photos of these dugout canoes. And I'm not sure if folks on this have looked at like how these are made or ever tried making one or played around with this. And I tried this once and it was, it's very difficult. Uh, but what they would do is they'd take a log and they would actually use fire and coals and put that on there and then allow it to smolder and then scrape out and dig it dig out, literally dig out this log to make a hollowed out sort of log as a canoe. So again, this is a, a very uh, point. We point this out because this is a, uh, very sort of sophisticated uh, technological understanding of producing things that they need uh, and also interacting with the land. How do you get a log that size in the first place? Uh, how do you burn it out? Uh, how do you understand how long to do that? How, knowing, to, knowing to make it to allow it to smolder and think about th th this is a culture too that understands being able to clear for agricultural land, uh, understands the migratory patterns of game animals uh, has uh, you know been documented relocating between the bay and the shore, right? And utilizing the land along the way, uh, maintaining that land. So there's a very sophisticated understanding. And I know a lot of the accounts that we have tend to be from people either observing it from ships or observing it through the lens, uh, even when they observe it on the land, th through the lens of, of settlers, not really understanding the culture that they're witnessing and sometimes bringing some bias to bear on that. Uh, but the idea is that there's this technical uh, sophisticated understanding of how to utilize the land and having the same similar needs that we do, right? Like looking for tra easy transportation, right? Walking through the thick brush of the pinelands can be difficult, but yeah, if you have, if you have a means of, of transportation and early settlers, when they got here, right, use the waterways as well. So these ideas of needing shelter for your family, needing food, needing a way to keep warm, uh, needing a way to move around the landscape. Uh, these, these are things that both cultures, all these, all these different cultures that have inhabited the pines uh, shared. Uh, they had different technologies and different ways of producing it, but it doesn't make it any less sophisticated uh, than what we have today. And yeah. they actually uh, made choices and selected trees um, for specific reasons. So they would choose trees that already had hollow areas in them, larger trees. Uh, maybe they would select certain species and then they used fire to actually um, figure out how to get these trees to fall. So they would uh, weaken the base of the tree with fire. They would keep burning it and putting it out and burning it until um, they weakened the structure and they could get that uh, tree to fall. Yeah, excellent point. In fact, one of the concepts that we'll talk about, and you'll hear this mentioned as we go uh, walk you through these different um, parts of this story and, and this information is, we're gonna talk about the notion of selective pressure, right? So. Uh, why trees are living and dying, which trees survived, which trees didn't survive. Um, there are natural forces that can apply, right? Like what time of year did it burn? That, that definitely selects which tree species or which trees would survive, how tall they were, how big they were. Um, but also when, when you have needs for things like building a dugout canoe or making agricultural land, right? You're picking, humans are picking uh, which trees they're going to use. Uh, sometimes for purposes of manipulating the land and sometimes to meet a need, but that still places 
selective pressure on that population of trees. And that has consequences for the future generations of trees and what you see today. Next. All right, so before this was an English colony, before it was a Dutch colony, uh, Southern New Jersey was a Swedish colony, part of the Kingdom of, of Sweden. Um, so this is uh, uh, an early map of uh, New Netherland. Uh, a lot of the settlement, yeah, was along the Delaware and sort of on the fringes of the pines. Um, but the people had the same sort of needs that uh, the people before them had and the people that after them had, so click. Um, so this happens to be a, the oldest <laughs> happens to be the oldest cabin uh, in the Western Hemisphere, um, and it's a, a Swedish cabin. I believe it's in Gibbsboro, uh, and you can see right they were looking for shelter the same way as the people who were here before them, and the same way as the people after. Next, and people were also looking for food. So there's uh, accounts, and we know this from Europe, that this was a, a cultural practice for dealing with livestock, uh, letting livestock uh, roam in the woods. So Calm talks about the hogs running wild in the woods. He, he talks about a number of livestock, but he had a very specific section on hogs. Um, and so you see the picture on the left is showing differential grazing. I believe it's in New York. On the left is an area that is a hog pen, and on the right is cattle. And so just having different livestock causes very, very different effects of, um, you know, different selective pressure on your ground species and what the soil conditions look like. And that's gonna affect how regeneration works, how nutrient cycling works. And then on the right, uh, Calm had interviewed a, a fellow named um, Aoki Helm. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I'm not, I don't speak Swedish, but he described, uh, he was an old timer. He was 70 years old, uh, which was an old timer then. Uh, in, in 1749. So this is someone who had been a child in the 1600s. And Helm described how um, in his youth, there was lots of grass in the woods, woods, but it was so much lessened at present. And, you know, overgrazing, uh, depending on the stocking level, we know this today from deer, right? Think of the landscapes you, you've probably heard that white-tailed deer are gobbling up all, all sorts of people's landscaping and gobbling up the tree seedlings in the forest. Well, cattle can do the same thing if you have too many of them trapped upon um, the same area. So there was woodland grazing, the livestock was being turned out, and that's going to have selective pressure on, on what things look like. So that was one of the early European influences, we think. Next. But it wasn't long before, before the English came up. Well, so the Dutch first took it from the Swedes and the English came and took it from the Dutch. And now your selective pressure is going to start to change, right? The, the colonies are uh, investments. So the, the European countries were sending colonists here and they needed to return that investment. So they needed to get, um, they weren't just interested in survival. Uh, when they're going to invest in these lands, they want something to be extracted from them. So where you might have had uh, some pressure from livestock, right? non-native ungulates eating the, the forest. Now you're gonna have very, very different selective pressures as the number of colonists and the, the style uh, sort of ramps up in intensity. Yes, that, that's a good point. And it's not that the Dutch and the Swedes weren't colonizing these lands. It's just that the English were very, very successful at it. And it was very, very widespread. So the, the, um, the choices you'd make as a colonist are very, very different as a colonial society than if you were just using the land for your own survival. And often those that were managing these colonies went into debt to do so. So they had to pay down their debt. So they had to send resources out and make money off of them. So that they're being pressured and that puts pressure on the land. Next. So the first pressure, uh, the, the Dutch recognized the value of this, even the Swedes recognized the value of Atlantic white cedar, that it was good for shipbuilding, that it was good for a whole lot of things, fence posts, uh, built, you know, structures. Um, Calm talks about that by 1749, um, economists are working to extirpate them entirely. Many cedar swamps are already quite destitute. Yeah, he was noting already in the mid 1700s that there was no cedar left, uh, that they had gone through and logged that. And that's, that's uh, a pretty rapid change to a lot of these wetlands. Um, so we know that that was one of the selective pressures in the wetlands. Next. But it wasn't just cedar that they were cutting. They were cutting, uh, it wasn't just white cedar, I should say. So Gabriel Thomas talks about sending um, great store of cedar. He was talking about Atlantic white cedar to Philadelphia from Salem County. Um, and he also talks about from Gloucester County sending 
not just Atlantic white cedar. He, he mentions um, chestnut, oak, ash. Um, Calm talks about how uh, Egg Harbor is exporting white cedar and red cedar uh, to different places for different purposes um, from Philadelphia and New York all the way to the West Indies. Um, and so we have a lot of early lumbering uh, for very specific species of, of high value. Yeah, in fact, early photos in Philadelphia, right, show cedar siding on the buildings, right? And a lot of that came from New Jersey. Uh, and same thing, uh, shipping manifests at Basto show cedar being sent to this, you know, to the West Indies from, from this region. Next. And as Bill points out, shipping manifests, right? So the shipping industry was a very important part early on um, in the Pinelands area. So here's a visual of that. So now you're starting to, let's th start thinking about what those selective pressures might be, because you're going to get your first choice in just a couple more slides here. And for ships, for fence posts, you're using, you're using different materials, right? Fence posts can be a smaller diameter tree of very certain rot resistant species. Okay. But is it porous? Something for shipbuilding, right? Notice the size of the timbers, uh, the, the form. So they're straight. So we're talking straighter, thicker, larger, and of very specific species. What's going to be valuable in a maritime environment? You don't want to have to, you know, rebuild or redeck your ship as frequently. So you're going to be picking for very specific structural qualities of the wood. And that means you're going to be looking through your forest for very specific things. Next. Uh, <laughs> but you're also just going to be hungry for wood because uh, it's nice to stay warm and to cook your food. So here's an example from South Brunswick. I know this is from the, the we have a lot of photos here that are early, from the early 1900s when Forest Service first got a camera. Um, but here's, a, here's an example of right, sort of the northern edge of the pines. Um, right, wood squandered away for fuel. There's lots of stuff that could just be cut and burned. Um, and it wasn't necessarily cut with any thought to what the forest should look like or how to regenerate it or uh, selective pressure beyond I need wood and I need to burn it. So you can see bad, you know, stumps that are, you know, uh, high stumps, um, trees that are, you know, lodged, uh, stuck in other ones, um, slash, which is a technical logging term. It means, you know, branches and tops. Um, not very nice appearance of the forest here. Next. And as you can see here, uh, this is sort of the anatomy of that kind of cut and Courtney, you can thank you for running this and you can describe this a little bit in more detail, but um, the idea is here, the selection isn't made by what's the next generation of trees going to be. It's driven by need. Uh, go ahead. if you have. Right. Yeah. So um, at this time, they're just cutting anything that they could find that meet their needs. And, you know, you, you have a lot of trees that are felled on the ground. That's just what some of these uh, images are helping you to visualize and the forest would look a lot different afterwards because of those practices. So here's the simulation of that to sort of set the stage. And um, we are building into our first choice. So uh, what next? Um, so just to mark some of uh, these events, sort of what's going on in some of the Pinelands folklore that's uh, being told and when some of these stories took place, our first choice will take place around the early to mid 1700s. Uh, so the famous white stag of Shemong story, right? So um, the, there's a uh, trail that connects um, the uh, Quakers. They, they go from Haddonfield to Tuckerton for a monthly meeting. Uh, crossing the Batstow River is, is fairly dangerous. Uh, so the Quaker meeting houses of Gloucester County and Burlington County meet and in around 1772 build Quaker Bridge. So there's a picture of Quaker Bridge as it stands today, and it's, the bridge is still there. Originally, it was made out of Atlantic white cedar, right? And the stagecoach, as legend has it, right, the white deer is an omen. It's, it was an omen um, or a warning. Um, so the idea is the coach was moving to, cro to cross the bridge at night, and they're in a hurry. The weather was poor. They spotted the white deer and stopped, uh, and then it vanished. And then when they uh, looked, the bridge had been washed out, and it wound up uh, saving people's lives. So that was around this time, uh, at, you know, so the idea of this, this omen that, you know, Quaker Bridge, this was well-traveled through the pines. Uh, next. Also, uh, the birth of the Jersey Devil, probably the most famous legend um, in the New Jersey Pinelands, right? So the Jersey Devil, uh, Deborah Leeds and Leeds Point in what is now Galloway Township in Atlantic, in Atlantic County, right? 
uh, gives birth to the Jersey devil, her 13th child. She's giving birth and says, let it be a devil. And then the child transforms into a, this creature with hooves and bat like wings and goes up the chimney. And, you know, people were reporting mass mass reporting this in the 1930s sightings of it. And it's still sightings reported today, but the origin of this comes from around this time period as well, as well as the next one, uh, Joel Molnar. Um, so famous highwayman in the Pinelands. Um, the interesting thing, there's many tales about him uh, and his exploits. Uh, highly recommend looking them up. But the interesting thing is here, a lot of, he, he was uh, English uh, sympathizer, uh, raided a lot of the revolutionaries' homes while they were off fighting um, in the war and would you know, burn the homes to the ground and raid, raid the villages. But one of the places that he frequent, frequented uh, was the region around uh, Old Washington, which is now the town is no longer there. It's in the middle of Wharton State Forest. So think about that. That had been a town center that this guy was raiding, and it's now part of Wharton State Forest at, uh, near Washington Turnpike and Washington Corner is where the town, you can see some of those old foundations. And then he was captured um, uh, in, in an area by Captain Balin at an inn in New Columbia, which is actually Nesco. So if you've been through Nesco, that, there was an inn there, and they surrounded it, captured him. And he was hanged um, and then in 1781. So to set the stage, we're right around, he was right around the American Revolution to just pre that for your first choice. All right. So that brings us to you guys. We're at our first choice. It's the 1770s. So our two options are going to be an iron forge or the sawmill. So what do you, you are living in this environment uh, and industry is here. Uh, there it looks like there might be a war brewing. What are you going to choose to um, to do with your land? Do you want to uh, build a sawmill? Do you want to build an iron forge? So it's your choice. We'll give everybody a minute to decide to vote. Oh, we're 50-50 right now. It's neck and neck. Get some more votes here. See which path we're taking. Oh, getting some more. We only require a simple majority. This is not a <laughs> no, <laughs> no super majority or two thirds majority needed. Well, what do you guys think? It looks like the iron forge path might be the winner here. Okay, so it looks like we're building an iron forge in the. Uh, so, uh oh, <laughs> oh <no. laughs> we're building an iron forge in the uh, in the early to mid 1700s. All right, so we're going to go down the iron forge path. So congratulations, you have built your new iron forge. Um, sorry, Team Sawmill, but yeah, you know, the, the, there's always opportunity in the future. Well, yes, so. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about uh, what it means to build the iron forge. So you build an iron forge. Uh, as you know, there was uh, iron mined uh, in the pines, um, primarily bog iron. Uh, and it's, it was mined for a variety of uses. And um, of course, as we're getting towards the American Revolution, demand for iron is high. Um, and that would influence your choices of trees, right? It would be different. Uh, so uh, based on uh, you know, what you're picking, you need, to you need to fire your furnaces. So the types of species you're picking and what you're picking is going to be uh, influenced by that. Next. So, right. First off, the easiest thing to do is, right, there's a lot of volume in big trees. So you're going to, you're going to cut those first, right? And you're going to cut the ones that are closest to your forge uh, because yeah, you need wood and it's a lot of work to cut many, many small trees, stack it and drag it back. Right. Everybody makes the joke about firewood, right? Like it warms you multiple times, right? It warms you when you cut it, warms you when you stack it, warms you when you finally burn it, right? So yes, the idea to fire your furnace, uh, you, want as, you want as little work as possible because you want to spend your time forging iron. You don't want to spend your time uh, processing wood to fuel wood to burn. Next. So pretty soon that switches to cutting as many trees as you can, but you're just cutting for volume at this point still, right? So you're not cutting it, small stuff you can cut, but it's not going to give you as much um, heat for your cut as, you know, mid-sized larger trees. You've cut the biggest stuff, but now you're just going to be cutting to try and achieve a volume need. Um, 
so here's a what that might have looked like through SVS. You, you have a, um, a mix of different tree sizes, but you've lost a lot of your big ones. And here's what that might look like after you've been done cutting. So you can see there are some trees that are left, uh, smaller things, smaller stems. There are there is somewhat of a, of a forest community, but you've really picked over and picked the biggest. Um, the biggest, the, the, the biggest trees, the largest volume, the most volume that you can get out of there. You see in the foreground, there's a little tiny seedling in front of that, um, that notebook. Um, so there is, there is a forest coming back, but you've, you've cut most of your volume out of your forest. Next. And then as you get more desperate, well, you run out of big trees, right? Cause you're trying to feed that forge and then you don't get so choosy anymore, but you need them close. So you're picking uh, smaller trees and you're cutting what you can as close as you can to your forge. Uh, the issue with that is that's now more work. It, it takes a lot more work uh, to do that, but that's, that's what you need to do to keep your mill open. So now uh, they talk about cutting over the land on 20 year cycles. And this, this is putting a lot of pressure, right? The white stag is in your road warning you, but uh, you're on this path and it's like, okay, well, we need to keep this forge going. So now they cut on these 20 year cycles, which is documented in some of the sources. All right. So what that might've looked like uh, after you finished, yeah, you've cut everything. There's very little fuel left for you <laughs> to cut. And so you're desperate at this point. So any, any of the wood that, that you're finding, right. As, as soon as it's big enough to turn into charcoal, you're turning into charcoal. Um, so this is a completely cut over land where you, which we think good chunks of the pylons might have looked like. Um, that uh, yeah, um, after 20 years, you'll come back and you'll try and cut this again and glean whenever you can. But your operating costs are really expensive now, and you might have run out of land, a land base to operate on. So, next. Bum, well, bum, bum. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, this is this is well documented that the the um, the iron industry in in South Jersey. Uh, probably just cut its way uh, out of out of existence. Certainly your operating expenses were going up, but they were going down out in Pennsylvania uh, where they had more concentrated ore, where they could use coal, anthracite coal. Um, this, the coal on this slide uh, refers to charcoal. Um, yeah, and even though you had 15,000 acres of land, uh, it's all been entirely consumed. And so you're, you're at basically out of wood um, just a little bit before the Civil War. And Bernie, I think you may have mentioned it, but I may, maybe not, but about how many acres on that 20 year rotation are they cutting? Right. You need about a thousand. The, the estimates I've seen were to keep the, the furnace in blast for uh, in order to make it, uh, you know, uh, commercially viable. You need about a thousand acres a year. And so 20 year rotation and a thousand acres, you need 20,000 acres. Uh, and that's just if you're cutting everything and taking small sticks. So it's, that's still pretty expensive to operate. Um, so unfortunately, you're so that it. adds up very quickly. Yeah. But it wasn't a bad choice. You were operating. You were able to make. You know, you were able to make iron for for several decades, and whole communities spring up. But um, but that was our first choice. Yep. And it changed the selective pressure on the place. The world didn't end, but the selective pressure certainly changed. Right. So. Next. All right. And a lot of the traces of that industry might be gone now. So there's examples from uh, the. Uh, the early forges and furnaces in New Jersey from Boyer in 31, right? The, the wood, the iron was hauled to Philadelphia on a road through the woods, which you can't find anymore. And so a lot of the ruins that we, that, you know, these pictures are from the thirties. Um, there are some in existence today, but the, the evidence of this industry has largely um, sort of been wiped away visually. It's still there, but it's been wiped away visually. So now what, now what are we going to do? Let's, we've got another choice for you. So again, to mark this point in history, I um, thought this legend was kind of interesting because I know having to pick between the sawmill and the iron forge might have felt a little bit like dealing with the devil. So I thought this would be apropos. Um, and this, this legend takes place, it's a common um, tale told uh, and around about uh, Samuel Gordon Guyberson, which the Guyberson family is still in, in the Pinelands today. Uh, this took place around Ocean County. Um, uh, he was known as Fiddlin' Sammy Buck and uh, was a fiddle player in the Pines. And there's still a culture of music in the Pinelands today, right? And he would play his fiddle and often accept challenges from other fiddle players. And they would have sort of a playoff. And, and one fateful night, he had a challenge from a man named Bill Den and uh, in an in a, in a, uh, inn near New Gretna. And they fiddled it out and it was kind of a stalemate. And Sammy was on his way home. And as legend has it, 
during that during that competition with Bill Den had said, hey, I could even challenge the devil uh, to a fiddling contest. And he was met by the devil on that walk. And then supposedly, although the the details on this are unclear, um, Sammy and the devil had a conversation and fiddled together where the devil taught Sammy several new tunes and his fiddling changed forever after that night. And he had learned the mysterious air tune that has never been written down, but he had played and many people had recognized this tune and uh, played it uh, throughout his life. And it was documented. And Sammy was an extremely talented fiddle player uh, to the point where all the strings would break except the final string on his fiddle. And he would continue the entire tune only on one string much like uh, you know, famed Niccolo Paganini, right? So he'd play fiddle tunes this way um, and his fiddle has disappeared, but they claim that you can sometimes still hear two fiddles playing in the night uh, when, you, when you walk alone in the pines. So this culture of music, this took place now uh, in the mid 1800s. So things are becoming more industrial in this part of the world and things are changing. There's more population moving into this part of the world and uh, European population moving into this part of the world. Industrializ industrialization starting to happen in the cities. Uh, there are, there's potential for jobs there and not everybody's necessarily working the land. So that leads us to our next choice. All right, so we have another choice. It's, are you guys ready? We have uh, our screens open. We have our phones ready. Are we gonna take the city work path or are we gonna take the country work path? So give me just a minute here. We'll open it for the next question. So are we gonna go for the city work or are we gonna go for the country work? I'll give you guys another uh, minute here to decide. And keep in mind the, the idea about making a deal with the devil that you staying on the land or moving to the, the city. It's been, a, it's, been a hard, it's been a hard couple of decades after the forge closed to, to find food, uh, uh, find sustenance for your family, but it's looking either people are all uh, answering the same way. Oh, okay. Oh, we got some also, more coming in here. Short course, so I, it I is can see the crowd would stick. A lot of the crowd might want to go with country work. All right. All right. So, what do you guys think? It's looking like a majority of our voting here is leaning towards country work. And not moving to the city. All right, so it looks like we're gonna take the country work path. Here we go. Okay, so congratulations. You've decided to stick it out on the land uh, doing co the country work, so you, you stuck around. So uh, in 1860, uh, some of the land use in the wetlands switches to cranberries. Now, remember this, this is, uh, at this point, it's sort of predating blueberry cultivation, right? We'll get to that, right? famous white fog but yeah but people are cultivating the land uh and they can grow cranberries here and uh, although not you know a lot of agriculture had difficulty in parts of the pinelands a difficult place to farm cranberries could be farmed here and that could be either dry picked like you see in some of these pictures or or uh, uh the use of flooding and, and and drainages either way there's manipulation of the land right you take this cleared land and you're using it and cultivating it uh, and, and growing uh, cranberries. So think about the differences in selective pressure uh, there. Selected away from forest. Yep. Next. Next. Uh, and where there is cedar, uh, so cedar grows back pretty fast, uh, comparatively speaking. In the rotation age uh, that is talked about for products um, in the first 300 years of European uh, settlement, um, talking less than you know, 60, 80 years old. Uh, so you and the friends of yours that stayed on the land uh, are going to go out and cut where you can. So um, old techniques to regenerate in places it did regenerate, um, in places it didn't. Um, but you're going to go out and you're going to be making uh, making a living during some time of the year uh, cutting cedar uh, during the times of year when you can't cut, when you can't uh, pick cranberries. Um, so you'd be getting cedar products. And you might not just use them for things like channel markers. Um, you know, you, there's a whole diversity of, uh, a whole diversity of products you can get out of them. There's small diameter stuff and click. And there's larger diameter uh, cedars that you might be harvesting for things like logs or vacation homes for other people or for, uh, for shipbuilding. Um, and so uh, cedar is gonna be a, and cutting cedar, the long, the most valuable wood product of the pinelands, you're gonna be cutting that. Next. 
also and charcoal charcoal still being made in this part of the world May, maybe not to not not the golden age of the iron forges but and, and glass forges uh, but there's there are still forges around, and also charcoal can be exported to other places, right, and sold. Or it can be sold right across the river in Philadelphia uh, for fuel over there. So this is uh, some visuals of what your land might have looked like when you decided to say the country work path after you did charcoaling. So uh, selective pressures for charcoal were just basically any uh, pine or any oak material, didn't matter the size. So your forest might look a little something like this as you're taking that path. Yep, and you're picking this material. Charcoal is made right under controlling airflow and oxygen. So yeah, here we have a picture of, they, they build what they call like a beehive and cover, take, take the uh, wood, uh, stack it in a way that air could move through it and um, build this, what they call beehive, cover it in earth and uh, create a hole at the top for some air circulation. And you can see here, they would allow that to smolder uh, for days. And then you'd have this, this charcoal that, that they could dig out of it once it was done smoldering. Note that this is the uh, Guyverson job. Uh, so oh, yeah. related to the, uh, to the notorious fiddle player. Yes, yeah, thank you for finding that photo too. Click. One interesting thing I've heard from um, some foresters in South Jersey is that the charcoalers a lot of times wouldn't take the biggest trees. And it's not because they were, uh, you know, they were the, the very biggest trees, the charcoalers later on. They didn't, uh, they didn't have saws that, that worked on them. They weren't big enough. They were too big, right? It was too, too difficult to handle a large log. Uh, it was much easier to handle, handle small stuff. If it's just a couple of you and a couple of friends that stuck it out in the land, you might not have the most capital resources. And so you're just going to cut the stuff that's easiest to cut. And those big trees kind of hard to cut. So what you end up getting is a seed tree harvest, right? Where your biggest, uh, you know, your biggest pines get left. Um, and you clear everything else and you cook, you know, uh, uh, scrape off the soil in a lot of places, but you end up making a nice seed bed and leaving a lot of seed trees. Yeah. So these are the parents for the next generation of trees that you might see coming along. So again, a difference in selective pressure. And unlike the forges that like, look, we'll get a lot of volume first and then they sort of tool down later when they run out of big trees, this charcoal industry, it's like, well, also it's very hard work moving those big logs around and stacking them. And so it's, oftentimes wouldn't would ignore them so you also are a witness to since you stayed on the land you're witness to huh there's a lot of other people coming in and, and they're noticing that there's land that's been um uh that's been kind of abused for a long time and so the state comes in and buys a couple of demonstration areas this is bass river uh there's agricultural land at bass river i believe well it might might just be other parts of the forest uh, and they're experimenting with different different species. They want to see, hey, how do we make forestry pay for the rural dwellers in, in this state, the people who stayed on the land? How do we make forestry, um, uh, how do we use that, this new science of forestry to, um, to support them? So they tried planting lots of different species like loblolly pine. And this is the early Allen Road Nursery. There were other nurseries in the pines. This is the Allen Road Nursery, uh, 1907, I think. There's a glass lantern, magic lantern slide, like a glass lantern slide from early um, state forester presentations around the state. And they, the state was producing trees so that landowners could discover the benefits of forestry um, and the benefits of intentionally making selective pressures, uh, selective choices. Yep, and there was a lot of experimentation at this time, as Bernie alluded to, there were different uh, tree nurseries around the state. Green, there's a nursery at Green Bank as well. They tried things like bucket planting. Lots of records in Bass River about this, where the landscape had been is, been impacted by rail fires. It's being impacted by all the practices you've seen through this presentation. So they're trying to get trees to grow back, and they're trying to figure out which species will grow here um, and and get some cover back on the land. Next, and this isn't just some minor concern. We've got. Uh, so here's a picture from uh, USDA uh, Profiles in Conservation about the, uh, the Lee family. Uh, you notice second from the left there is Gifford Pinchot, who uh, had been the governor of Pennsylvania, but also the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service, um, visiting and hunting with the Lee family. Um, there's big names. Gifford Pinchot is a very close friend of Theodore Roosevelt, the president of the United States. There's big names and a lot of interest in, in demonstrating what 
uh, good land management can do for uh, for you know people in America, for the rural land dwellers, um, for rural peoples. Next. Also, we have Elizabeth White. So those of you who have been to uh, White's Bog, right, uh, creating uh, commercial cultivars of blueberries. So some of the some very early work in uh, agricultural genetics, right, and, and talk about selection, selecting blueberries to make um, commercial cultivars. So now this also changes the ability to um, cultivate some of the uplands, and it turns out pineland soils work quite well for growing uh, blueberries. So uh, Elizabeth White was uh, key to uh, sort of discovering that and creating these commercial cultivars, uh, many of which uh, the modern cultivars used in your grocery stores come from right here in, in New Jersey. So uh, yes, this, this also changes that selective pressure on the landscape that now uplands can be cultivated as well. Next. So really trying to make an economy for those things in the rural places, but it still needs more work. So my grandparents' generation, um, city folks from the, from Jersey City, those the people who made the choice to go to the city and, and work there, some of them are coming back to the land and doing things like rehab, uh, where they're planting trees and building uh, infrastructure for, for natural spaces or for what we consider to be natural spaces. And people are rediscovering, the, the folks that chose to go to the city, they're rediscovering the value of this, this work in the country. So we've got another choice for you here. So we're gonna go through some of the, we're gonna skip a couple of decades here in the middle part of the century. Um, but now what? Now that there's been this rural, uh, this work that's been able to keep you on the land, now what do we do? We're almost there, almost to our next choice. But in the meantime, right, around the 1970s, we have the Pinelands Commission that was created. So in 1979, we have the Pinelands Commission created, right? They oversee the land use, development, and protection of the Pinelands area. Yep, and this thwarts a, jet, a giant jet port being made uh, in this region uh, that would have um, made a lot of this no longer forest anymore. So major, major diversion in terms of, uh, of land use and, and certainly selective pressure. So we have a direct expression of the people at the national level and at the state level saying that we want to keep a lot of these rural land uses and, and practices alive that created this environment that we have here um, and, and keep it interesting. So here's your choice. All right, third choice. What are we gonna do? It's the 1970s. Are we gonna sell the land? Are we gonna preserve the land? Or are we gonna manage the land? All right, so get your phones ready. Get your web browsers ready. So this is the next question. Are you going to sell it? Or are you going to preserve it? Or are you going to manage it? We'll give you guys all a minute here. We had some good responses on the last one. <laughs> all right. We're getting some coming in here. Notably, no one's saying sell it. Oh, good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you can choose anything you want. No, yeah, absolutely. No, I'm no not to... yeah, certainly. All right. Oh, oh, Ooh. we got a lot of moving around going on here. here. Are we going to see how it plays out? Ooh. All right. What do you guys think? I think we've got a. I think we've got an answer. We've got an answer. So I think Looks like we may be taking the management path. This from the same folks right. who decided to keep us on the land, so it makes sense. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that does make sense. All right. So we're heading down the management path. So congratulations, you have chosen the management path. So here we are. Uh, you know, not early 80s. And um, so the management path doesn't necessarily mean that you're anti preservation. It just means that you've chosen to uh, make choices about the selective pressure that is placed on your forest and inter and, and choices about how you're interacting with it. So leaving it alone is certainly one choice you can make, but you it's in a continuum of choices. So here uh, in this picture, uh, you can see this is a picture of a uh, what, uh, what, we, what we call a drum chopper and it's being pulled by a bulldozer. So you can see that wheel behind that bulldozer it has these blades on it. it can be filled with water to add weight and the idea here is right remember in that in that early 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 scenario when natives were managing the land that there was grass 
uh, throughout the underneath those trees. Well, now think about what it looks like when you're driving through the pines, what a lot of that understory looks like, right? It's blueberry and huckleberry with a thick root mat. Well, to break that up, they use a machine like this and then they can reestablish and put fire into the system. Uh, and this is um, old, this is old uh, blueberry fields uh, being drum chopped to be able to uh, grow forest here. But the idea is you can break up that root mat. You can also replant trees, right? So this is uh, Atlantic white cedar uh, being replanted. Uh, so you can replant trees directly. You can also, right, make choices if you have parents uh, for trees, you, the, tr the next generation of trees you can choose, but now you can, you can base your choices off anything, you know, anything you want if you're actively managing it. So you could say you might have a need, you might choose for that need, or you might choose because you're trying to grow a new generation of trees from that stock and, and make your choices to grow uh, healthier or longer lived trees or, or propagate some of the things that had been selected out, right, from the iron forge cutting and from the practices that were there before you. Next. And uh, here we have another picture. This is from the 90, this is actually, uh, I'm familiar with this picture. This is in Bass River in 2000. Uh, this is uh, a site being planted by 4-H Club, uh, the Goat Busters. Um, uh, and they were planting these trees uh, in an area that had been burned by the 1999 wildfire. And you can see it had burned down to sand. This is a very sandy site to begin with, but the idea about being able to put trees back and making choices about the selective pressures on that place and how the forest comes back. And this wasn't planted to come back like a plantation. It was planted that, you know, there was this mix of uh, shrubs and trees, and now there is some grass in this site as well. Uh, but this site, yeah, was, was restored from uh, that really, really, really intense fire. Next. There's also a modest wood products industry. So, uh, or that there was, I should say. So this is uh, one of the small businesses. I believe this is uh, Rusnik Brothers. Um, and rather than uh, having the widespread exploitation the of uh, the forest that we saw with um, all the different industries competing for wood, uh, there's a very specific uh, kind of wood that they're they're looking for here. And this is small to medium diameter uh, trees um, getting used for uh, pulp. And kind of an exciting part about being taking the management path in this day and age is right. You can build industries or industries can be built around what your forest needs rather than right. Remember the iron forge, we were try basically building the forest around what that iron forge needed until that collapsed. Right. But you can actually make choices to build your industry based on the things that the forest needs. Next. So that brings us to today. Uh, some of the, projects that we have going around in the Pinelands today help uh, restore some of the healthy species and make it more diverse. So in this uh, picture, it's actually an oak regeneration project, but we have a nice mixture of shortleaf pine and other pine species uh, in the system as well. And uh, this was taken in the fall. So if the trees look brown, that's okay. Those are the oak trees that are in the area. The work that was done was in the foreground. You see that more open area where you can see the forest floor. If you look um, to the sort of middle background on the left, you see a slightly blue, more bluish green. So that's white pine. So previous generations of land managers thought that, you know, white pine would be a good addition for, for uh, increasing profitability of forests in, in New Jersey, in, the, in this part of the forest in New Jersey. Um, and so we chose the selective pressure here because we're the managers uh, that, that came up with this prescription. And we... Uh, selected against white pine. We thought, you know, knowing what we know about climate change, what the expectations are for, um, for what this habitat is going to look like, and also for what, you know, the sort of the zeitgeist for, for what native species are, we selected against it and got rid of the white pine in this area and then applied pressure to not favor a uh, white pine seed bed. Also, uh, the oaks regenerating are from seed, so you'll see cut over oak a lot of the time will sprout back from the stump, and that stump could be very, very old, um, and you'll see that often uh, riding around the pines. So some of that is also favoring regeneration from seed and growing some new rootstock in there so for long-lived uh, trees. Instead of having, uh, uh, click, instead of having um, the, you know, you'll see a lot of places where, oh, I guess we had the I thought we had the oak seedling picture next, but excuse me. Uh, instead of having lots of different sprouts of, of oak where you've got a 300-year-old stump or a 200-year-old stump. But also speaking to this photo, right? The idea, remember when we were reading about some of, or when we we're talking about like some of those pre-settlement conditions and how the fire moved through the forest 
right? Density was very different, right? We know that. We know density of the forest was very... So here, density has been controlled. And yes, this was a thinning, but many trees are left behind. You can see, though there's slash, which is a term foresters use for the things that are left behind after uh, a forestry operation. Yes, that is flammable and it will be. Uh, it'll make that a little... Uh, it will make that more flammable um, in early years after this thinning operation, but then fire is put in after uh, this is completed. And that stuff is consumed uh, with some prescribed burning. And uh, that now you have these more open conditions and the, the selective pressure changes from the fire, right? And it might look more like some of those things that this forest had evolved with over thousands of years. There's those oak seedlings starting from acorns. Yes, and you can even see some of the acorns in the foreground. And again, uh, changing the selective pressure, how would wildfire move through this? Again, this forest has been manipulated and then fire was put on the ground. So you can see um, you know, that, yes, the, the density of this forest is different, uh, but you know, a lot of the native components are still there. And then how does this function? What does the selective pressure look like? Just choosing the management path doesn't mean that you can't choose to not touch it. Of course you can do that, but you, you, you can make an active choice of how you want to apply selective pressure on that forest. And the objective here, we're, this is right next to a large housing development. And so this is a forest that maintains forest cover and maintains some habitat, but also protects that area from um, those houses from fire. Um, and so there's a balance. There's a balance of your objectives, which you can apply because you get to control selective pressure. All right, and these are areas that we uh, are better known as wildland urban interfaces. So you have that interface of the forested areas, the wildland, and then uh, the urban areas that are around much more today than they were years ago. So uh, that puts us on, you know, there's a management path future, right? Like there's a lot of different decisions as uh, Bernie alluded to. Um, you know, we have different selective pressures now, right? The climate is changing. So, you know, we always think of the, the climate changing and impacting the forest, right? Like what's going to happen to the white pine or what's going to happen to different species mixes? What's going to happen with sea level rise? But the forest actually does act on the climate too. And we're trying to be very conscientious of that because it does pull carbon out of the air naturally. Uh, so we look at and quantify five different carbon pools in the forest where carbon is stored and they all stored a little bit differently, right? So the soil you can see in, in New Jersey, the majority of it in forest carbon is stored between soil and above ground live carbon um, by mass per acre um, or by mass, this is by mass for the whole state. So uh, you can see that, yeah, it's stored between those two pools. They're very interesting. They store carbon in different ways. So soil carbon tends to be more stable uh, and it holds carbon for very, very long periods of time, but it also accumulates relatively slowly. Whereas the above ground live has lots of green living tissue, but think about what happens in those wildfires. It can be damaged in wildfires and then you can damage your ability in future decades to take in, um, to take carbon out of the air. So in a nutshell, we do look at these things as part of the decision-making and thinking about that mix of things and selective pressure and how that impacts the forest ability to store and sequester carbon from the air. Right, so a lot of these risks that are uh, acting across the landscape um, in tune with the forested areas and uh, also the trade-offs um, in deciding how you're gonna choose to act next and uh, what might happen. So we commend you on choosing, I commend you on choosing the management path because it means that you're turning towards the system. You're gonna face it and you're gonna involve yourself in it and what its future looks like. So Bill mentioned about the soil carbon being relatively stable and it is, it's been laid down for thousands of years since the end of the ice age, really. Uh, for the last 10,000 years, the soil carbon has been laid down in, in the wetlands of the pines. But that doesn't mean it's invulnerable. That doesn't mean that if you just leave it, it will continue. The trends that happened for the last 10,000 years are gonna be different from what the future is. So we have an analog for some of the conditions here. The muck soil of the pinelands, um, the wetlands here is very similar to the to wetland soils in other places. This is a cedar swamp that used to exist on the border of North Carolina and Virginia, the Great Dismal Swamp and, uh, or Great, uh, yeah, Great Dismal Swamp National Wildlife Refuge. And, they had a cedar forest very similar to ours, and they had big, thick organic soils very similar to ours, but they had a drought. They had a drought that was followed by a wildfire, and that wildfire consumed the soils. Just like, think of peat fires, like um, peat fuel in Northern Europe. It consumed the, the soil the same way, dried out 
uh, muck soils, dried organic soils burn the same way. And so the picture on the left, you can see the roots are dangling in the air. They didn't used to be, they were in that soil. And so because of the variability of the future conditions, the previous conditions and the, the environment that created the previous you know, uh, conditions that made that soil, not the same environment. Now on the bottom right, what you have there is a giant shallow lake a giant shallow lake that doesn't have a forest on it. It has a plant community. It's got algae. It's got wildlife value. It's got all sorts of habitat utility, but it's not the same thing. And in terms of your carbon budget, turning towards the problem and facing what you're going to, uh, what choices you're going to need to make and balance that the pressures on the forest are not the same that they have been. And so learning as much as you can about what the pressures are going to be and how those things are going to interact and affect the forest. Um, that's really important. So we commend you for choosing the management path to try and learn the most that you can. And, yeah, and your patient's sticking it out through all these different choices. Um, I'll, also, I'll point out the stumps like that. You can find there's a spot like that in Bass River along Coal Road that you can find stumps like that from an old fire. So now that we've come to the end of our management path, well, where does that leave us? So that brings us to 2022, right? So what's, what's going to be your choice moving forward? How are we going to look at all of these things? How are we going to look at the history? Uh, the past use to the land, how do we interact with it? What are we going to do? Are we going to sell it? Are we going to continue our current path? Are we going to continue the management path? Or are we going to choose another path? Are we going to innovate and try new things? Well, that's, that's where we come to the decision is going to be up to all of you. It's going to be up to all of us moving forward in this Pinelands landscape. Yes, we don't have a survey for this one. <laughs> There's no poll for this one. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, that was an awesome job, guys. I really enjoyed the presentation. I love the uh, historical uh, you know, setting you uh, set for us with the uh, anecdotes about uh, what's happened here in the Pine Lands and uh, really neat to see those different outcomes and how uh, your know, choices you know, affect the selection and all that has uh, definitely taken place you know, for many years here in the Pine Lands. So that was a, a really neat program and I really enjoyed the uh, feedback and the interaction uh, that the people watching and myself had the opportunity to participate uh, as we went through. Oh, thanks, Joel. And we appreciate folks' patience. It was definitely hard to figure out the timing because there's all these different choices people can make. So we, we appreciate everybody for, for their interest and in, in participation. And they're sticking it out. This was a little bit longer than we planned on it being. Uh, it depends on which path people choose and how much, <laughs> how much detail we go into. We could talk about this all day long, and we do. Uh, if anyone out there has a question, uh, please feel free to dial in uh, the phone number and uh, they'll ask you to put in the meeting ID or the pound sign and uh, we'll be here to uh, help answer any questions you may have. I, uh, a friend of mine just sent me a book not too long ago to read. It's called The Age of Wood. And uh, a lot of that early part of the presentation really, uh, you know, that makes me think about that wood because it talks about... Um, particularly England and Spain needing large trees for masks mm -hmm. and uh, for the, the sailing masks. And that's one of the reasons why they needed to come to the America was for that reason, because they had cut all the trees and trees were getting very expensive to make a, for a ship mask in Europe. And uh, that was one of the great bonuses they found when they uh, hit the Americas. So I'm going to give a plug for a book here uh, that, go that goes along with it. It's a children's book. Um, uh, my, uh, my mom was a children's librarian. And so we have, uh, excellent children's books and this is by it's a Diana Applebaum and the illustrator is Michael McCurdy called giants in the land. And it's about exactly that Joel. It's about the, the mast pines of new England, uh, which were white pine trees that, uh, were marked by the King's agents. Uh, and then there were, you know, roads built to the sea to, to bring these giant, uh, mast, you know, white mine, uh, white pine mast trees, uh, for the Royal Navy to build their ships so that they could, you know, take over the, the high seas. Um, it's a fantastic book, fantastic children's book. Awesome. So kind of along these lines, as we're waiting for people to call in, um, I also have a, a suggestion for a really good one that I've read recently. It's called American Canopy. So it goes through the history, um, just kind of like how we did today of what forest meant to people, what they were used for, how they interact with them. It's a, it's a really interesting and, and good history. Excellent. 
Yeah, I mean, this is all, <clears throat> this whole program is all about educating. So those resources are great. Thanks for uh, providing them. And uh, you know, that's what it's all about is the more we can educate, the better we're prepared, just like you said, to make those decisions in the future. So we can, um, you know, have outcomes that are going to be positive for the environment and people, you know, kind of that balance, that balance is kind of right where we've been uh, the whole time, uh, particularly since 1979 going forward, is try to balance the ecology, the economy and people and trying to, to all work out uh, for a positive future. Okay. We'll give it just a little bit longer because there is a, a good 30 second delay. Um, if anyone would like to have some follow up, uh, our presenters emails are here on this last slide as well. So please, if it's okay with those guys, feel free to email any other follow up questions you might have. Uh, we got a thumbs up. So I think that's a good a positive sign there. Um, Absolutely. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's a, lot, it's a lot to think about. You know, we always think about the Pinelands. A lot of people say, man, it's this pristine area. Uh, but once you know the history, you know, it's definitely been manipulated by man many times. And those decisions uh, have changed and created the forest that we have. And, uh, oh, we got a caller. Always like callers and talking instead of me. Hello, you're on the air live with your question. Hi. Um this is William Cromerty. Give it just a little bit longer because there is a, a good 30 second delay. Um, if anyone would like to have some follow up. Uh, if you turn down your sound, we won't have that feedback. As well. So please, if it's okay with those guys, feel free to email any other follow up questions you might have. Um, there we go. Okay, thank you. Does that do it? Yes, yep. perfect. Hey. So, uh, you ready? Yes. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. William Cromerty here. Um, I've been involved for a little while with the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. Mm -hmm. And one of the focuses is on the type of restoration that would begin to bring back some of these open woodland and savanna type habitats. Uh, my particular interest, because I'm an entomologist, is in um, seeing the return of some of the native flowering, um, forbs especially, also the shrubs, and especially the butterflies. My work with butterflies and skippers in the pines has shown that the loss of habitat because of fire suppression and the closing of the forest canopy has been the biggest factor in the disappearance of species like dotted skipper and arago skipper and a whole large collection of uh, species of that kind. And I just was going to invite you panelists to, to comment on the ways that uh, the ways that the kind of management you're proposing would uh, would enhance and restore this uh, lost biodiversity. Well, certainly uh, that that component of biodiversity. Uh, I mean, uh, so my background's in ecology, and that's uh, that's the stuff that that excites me. Uh, one of the things that excites me about forest management, um, when we have the opportunity to do projects uh, where we can do that sort of restoration, we've already been involved in a couple of different projects to do very small scale forest management activities to restore rare plants, um, but not just for the, the sake of the rare plants, right? It's that the idea of restoring that kind of community um, and, and that habitat uh, for, uh, for the communities, the insect and, and other animal communities that um, that they're dependent on, or that are dependent on them. Um, yeah, this is this is such exciting. It's such an exciting side of the work. Um, in fact, some of the research I'm doing is to see, you know, are there uh, the light availability, the light environment underneath this pine canopy? Is the you know is there some sort of critical threshold at which, you know, below a certain density of trees, um, that you know you'll have enough light for these other plants? And there's plenty of research in other in other southeastern pine grassland systems. Um, but so hoping to bring that some, some of that here, uh, to apply it to our land. Yeah. And we've definitely been aware of, you know, one of the things we monitor and track, we have a system of plots throughout all of New Jersey, um, that we monitor and track, but we, we do look at forest density. In fact, some of the simulations today, they were actually derived from that data. Um, and, uh, we, we do look at that and monitor and track it and, and try to find, um, you know, regions of the forest that have densities, uh, kind of well beyond that sort of historic range of variability 
Um, and you know, we, we talk about that a lot. And, and Bernie alluded to some of the examples where we've uh, done some trials for like restoration of habitat for rare plants. And the response by the plants was like, it was very rapid, which was, was really interesting to see. Um, also, I mean, I'll also point out a uh, very famous forestry researcher, right? Reinecke uh, did some research and he had done some research in New Jersey in the 1930s, but he, he's famous for develop, you know, discovering this logarithmic relationship of tree spe spacing. And one of the things he looked at shortleaf pine in Southern New Jersey and said, hey, it's, it's not, originally this tree was adapted to, it wasn't, it wasn't competition killing this tree off. There's something else, right? And yeah, we know the fire regimen was probably doing that. It evolved under different selective pressure. So certainly a lot of the plants that grew in and among these forests evolved with different selective pressure. Yeah, and just kind of to play off of some of the things that Bill and Bernie said. So we do have a lot of plans in the works right now um, working with a lot of other uh, public agencies, other organizations um, across the Pinelands area to develop some of these uh, type of habitat areas that we're looking for that are uh, going to be more supportive for those types of species, uh, both plants and uh, animals. Yes, and we have another caller. Hello, you're live on the air with your question. Hello. Uh, Hi. I am uh, interested in what you said about the uh, selecting against the white pine, uh, which which is like the natural. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the decision to go with the I mean, because the decision to go with a different the oak tree rather than the um, the, the pine trees, especially since I thought we were supposed to be preserving the pine lands from invasive oak trees. That's, Thank you. that's an excellent question. So there's there's different groups of families of pines. So there's the southern yellow pines is sort of a, a group of pines like in that group is pitch pine, shortleaf pine, um, and other south pond pine, other southeastern pines. Those are the species. Those are the pine trees that um, were most commonly found are most commonly found in the pinelands. And as part of that activity that we showed you, yes, shortleaf, uh, pitch, Virginia pine. Those were all. Actually, there's a funny example of one of those Virginia pines that Courtney and I uh, talked about while we were marking that activity. Um, so we kept in that activity, you saw a lot of those oaks, but we kept um, the southern yellow pines that were in there. The ones that we removed were white pine, which is from a different group of uh, more soft pines, and those are more northern species. Um, and those were the ones that were there were introduced uh, during plantings in the 20th century. Um, so they were, they were seed that was blown in. The, the trees that were on that site that were white pines were from seed that was blown in from adjacent stands that were planted um, deliberately with this more northerly uh, type of pine. And so we kept the, the pinelands native species, we kept those. Yeah, and it might have been a bit of a misnomer. I mean, so we talk about that being oak regeneration, but the reality is it's a mix of oak and the native pines being the fire adapted shortleaf pitch pine and Virginia pine. White pine is not particularly well fire adapted. Um, and it, you know, it, it had, it, like Bernie said, it had come in from uh, areas that had been planted in the 20th century. Um, so maybe a bit, of, a bit of a misnomer. And part of that has to do with also what takes the most work to kind of get back. So the idea was the, the oaks in that site had been cut over so many times that the oak component of that site was going to be from seed rather than trying to favor things just growing off the stump of practice okay. called coppice. Also, as foresters, oh, okay. and speaking, spending so much time looking at air photos, the southern yellow pines have more in that photo. They have more of a. After this presentation ends, you'll be able to pull it up on YouTube, and you go back to it. You'll see that the in the sort of the foreground on the left, there's more of a yellowish tone to the the greens, and those mm -hmm. are the those are the native pines. Um, and so, yeah, we kept those. Those are those are good. Yeah, good catch though. Thank we you. appreciate your bringing it up too, because we had some discussion when putting this together, like, oh, the trees are brown. <laughs> like people are going to think they're all dead. And it's like, so we're a little sensitive with that. But thank you. No, you're welcome. Uh, very interesting discussion and presentation. Thank you very much. This, this oh, has you. been informative. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. But, you know, I know we call it the pine lands and we refer to pine, but there are definitely some very natural uh, oak areas. And uh, you know, the, the pine lands wouldn't be the pine lands without that intermixed oak and all those oak species as well. They, they're definitely part of the picture, uh, too, not just the pine trees.
Yeah, one of the things I think is a that happens is we we get this idea, you know, like the land looks a certain way and it's it's either uniform or, you know, I don't think I certainly didn't appreciate even growing up in New Jersey, I didn't appreciate the diversity of the pinelands and how subtle differences in, in the soils and subtle differences in, in you know, like um, hydrology make such a difference in the plant communities and how actually diverse they are. Um, that's been really particularly in areas where you have lots of sunlight hitting the ground. That's been something that's been really exciting for me. Um, the more time I spend in the pines, um, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Early in my career here, a fire tower observer told me, uh, you know, if you keep looking at it like that, like, you know, looking at the subtle differences, you're going to get the sand in your shoes and you won't want to leave. And yeah, that's yeah. definitely true. I've found that to be true about this place. I mean, shortleaf pine, that's a good example. I was taught, you know, the pinelands are pitch pine. And then suddenly when you start to understand how to identify shortleaf pine, you know, seeing that there's there's a diversity even in those pines. Um, and then seeing as you're driving down the parkway, say, oh, there's loblolly pine here. That's, it's very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the, you know, just like you're saying, it is kind of a subtle diversity but yeah, the more time you immerse yourself into the area, you pick up on those subtle little things. And uh, it, it just makes the Pinelands more special just because each little area has got its own little niche within, you know, the Pinelands, Pine Barrens, you know, the Pine, the Pygmy Pines up in the Pine Plains. You know, that area feels totally different than a cedar swamp, which might only be 100 yards away from you. It's just that transition really uh, is a unique feel. Yeah. yeah. And for people managing land or looking, it's, it's a very interesting and subtly challenging place. Um, so yeah, you know, everybody thinks of, you know, like uh, being a land manager and working in like, you know, these, you know, national forests or majestic forests in the West are really, really giant stands of like Douglas fir, maybe the redwoods in the national park. Right. But, but uh, the thing about the pinelands that's pretty interesting is that it is so subtle. So when you're making decisions about like, oh, is this going to be a pine oak mix? Is this going to be pine? Is this going to, how is this going to respond if we put fire back into it? Uh, it's very humbling, which is actually a lot of fun to manage. It's, it's fun to, it's fun to walk in with some assumptions and then have those assumptions kind of proven wrong or be humbled a little bit by nature. It, it, I think it's, it's a, a fun resource to interact with for that reason. Yeah, it's a very complex system. All the little micro sites. That was what I was uh, this past summer. I was walking a site and came across these flowers I'd never seen before, and spent a, a bit of time um, uh, looking them up and keying them out. Are they the, the rare version or are they a, a less rare cousin? And the only difference in in the site was just a tiny little difference in elevation. The kind of thing you might get from you know uh, you know a tree. Uh, you know, uh, uh, a tip up mound, you know, a tree being uprooted. And so that all that complexity is uh, challenging and exciting. All right. Well, I want to, you know, thank you guys and gals. You did a great job. It was really neat to see your perspective from the management side and, you know, all that goes into making these decisions and the, the consequences that uh, they have or don't have. And I really want to thank you for your time to put this together. It was a very interesting, interactive, and enjoyable morning. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Great. Thanks for thank you. Me. All right. On uh, that note, I'm going to uh, shut down the live stream here in a second. Uh, kind of on the forest note, we're going to continue. Uh, next week, we have a program on a, a red maple uh, syrup project that's going to, it's taking place currently on the campus of Stockton University. And that's going to be the topic for next week. So uh, tune back in. Also next week, we're going to start at 1030 as opposed to 10 o'clock. So just a heads up there. Again, thank, thanks everybody from the Forest Service. That was a really cool presentation. And uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, have